Please welcome to No Walls. As you can see, everybody's not abiding by the that we are being obedient. Welcome to No Walls. This is my first video. So this is going to be a new experience. Um, again. What's good, No Walls? Uh, my name is Trey, and today I get to share God's word with you uh, once again. Um, yeah, I do want to acknowledge that today is the 4th of July, uh, and I know that many of us are celebrating today, and, um, but I also know there's many of us who are confused and conflicted, um, some of us that are mourning and lamenting, uh, just with the hypocrisy of the history of the 4th of July. It's, it's hard to deal with that the uh, United States was declaring its independence in 1776, yet it, uh, still enslaving black people and, and stripping away the identity, cultural identity of indigenous people. And so I realize that uh, for many of us, it might be difficult to celebrate today. Uh, we might, after the recent events, uh, we've gained more awareness of uh, the reality of um, the 4th of July and the hypocrisy of it. And so... Uh, it is very biblical to lament. It is very biblical to mourn uh, this day um, and the evil that, um, the, the hypocrisy that existed, um, yeah, on July 4th, 1776. So I do want to acknowledge, um, yeah, people that may be dealing with the 4th of July in many different ways um, and acknowledge that reality. Uh, many of you are celebrating and others of you are confused and conflicted and um yeah, and mourning and lamenting. Mourning and lamenting is very biblical. It's a whole book dedicated to lamenting. It's called Lamentations. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that reality. Uh, and I want, and yeah, I'm praying that God would guide you um, as you, yeah, for those of you that are wrestling, and pray that God would guide you in that process. Um, yeah, so today, because it's 4th of July, and, you know, talk about independence and freedom on this day a lot. Uh, today we're gonna we're gonna kind of talk about freedom a little bit. Uh, before we do, uh, I do want to clarify something um, <clears throat> that when I say that I'm coming to share God's word with you, let me tell you what I don't mean. What I don't mean is that last night I had a vision or a dream from the Lord, and He gave me the topic for today and the passages and the right analogies, and He just uh, downloaded them into my brain through a vision or a dream. Uh, what I don't mean is that I, uh, last night I did not spend time in a prayer closet and hear the audible voice of God tell me what today's message is. Uh, that's not what I mean when I say I'm coming to share God's word. Um, and I don't mean that I have greater access to God than you do. If you are in Christ, we have the same access to God. Uh, and I just want to clarify that. that when I'm coming to share God's word, uh, what I don't mean is that I had... Um, as real as mystical experiences are, I did not have a mystical experience in order to deliver this word to you today. <laughs> you know, um, that wasn't how this process went about. And um, yeah, I mean, furthermore, like uh, God said, the Bible says, the author of Hebrews says in the very first verse, he says, uh, God used to speak through prophets to our ancestors, but now he has spoken to us by his son. And so God has spoken through his son, through Jesus. And therefore, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard. So God has spoken. And all I'm, when I say I'm sharing God's word, all I'm doing is because God has spoken, <laughs> all I'm doing is drawing your attention. I just want to draw your attention to what God has spoken. I mean, as we understand more deeply what God has spoken, we understand more deeply who God is. And when we understand more deeply who God is, we live our life out of God's love for us. Uh, and this is a whole sermon in and of itself. Gosh, um, just because I, I think there's been, there has been some, some abuse in the church, you know, and, and I want to acknowledge that too. There's been some abuse in the church uh, from pastors and spiritual leaders um, because uh, they brand themselves as the prophet of God. Um, and while there are still uh, prophets, uh, there might still be prophets, um, the final authority is God's word. <laughs> um, he has spoken. And so I just want to draw again, when I say I'm coming to share God's word uh, with you, all I'm saying is I want to help draw your attention to what God has already spoken. Um, and, and as a result, understand what God has spoken. 
And um, as we understand what God has spoken, we understand more of who God is and what God is like. And then we live our life out of his love for us. And that's an important that's an important distinction. Again, I, this is probably this is my soapbox, but I think this is really important, which is why I'm taking the time to say this. Um, is that we oftentimes, I mean, me growing up, people would say, Trey, why do why do you do that? Like, what's what's motivating you to do this? What's motivating you to go to South Asia? What's motivating you to do that and do this? You know, what's motivating you to be a a Bible scholar and a pastor and all these things? What's motive? What's your motivation? And my answer used to be because I love. God, oh my gosh, I love God so much. I'm so passionate about God. Um, but in this last season, and even in this current season of life, I haven't really been loving God. I haven't been happy with God. I've been dissatisfied with God. I've been disappointed in God. He's, you know, set me straight graciously. Um, but I haven't been loving God. Uh, and if I if I lived out of my love for God, my love which fades, my love which fails, <laughs> like that would that wouldn't be a good life to live, honestly. It'd be pretty disappointing. But when I live my life out of God's love for me, how does the Bible talk about God's love, right? It talks about God's love as being steadfast and abundant, meaning that his love is overflowing, that it never ends. It does not expire. It endures all things, right? And when I live my life out of God's love for me, uh, that's something that's much more lasting and something that's much stronger than my love for God. And so my hope uh, for those of you that are in Christ is that, um, yeah, as I share God's word, that we grow in understanding God's love for us. We live in response to that rather than, you know, trying to love God. Because the reality is there's times when we, I mean, our nature is to not love God. There's times when we just are not loving God. And, um, and so with that being said, uh, I, I do think the Bible calls us to love God, but the Bible calls us to live our life out of love for God. And so that's an important distinction that I think is important, which is a whole nother sermon. I've already touched on about five already, you know what I'm saying? So, um, but yeah, so I just I thought that was important just because uh, as I share God's word with you, again, as I draw your attention to the scriptures, my goal is that we would together understand more deeply what scripture is saying, understand God more deeply, um, understand who he is and what he's like, and as a result, live our life out of his love um, for us. And so, um, so yeah, so we're going to talk about freedom today, and, and that's a little bit of intro of, of my hopes uh, for this message. Um, let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll do a, a quick outline, and, and we'll jump into it. Lord, uh, you are sovereign, and you are good. It's so hard, especially during these times and on days like this, to to see that you are good and sovereign. Um, when black and indigenous people um, were enslaved, meanwhile, uh, the United States was declaring independence, God. That's hard to deal with a lot of times, Lord, and it's hard to see that you are good and sovereign. Um, Lord, would you show us that you are good and sovereign through our message today as we understand more deeply what freedom is? Uh, would you help us uh, to understand who you are and would we live our life out of your love for us? Amen. Cool. So I do want to I do want to give another preface um, that I I would love feedback. You know, if if there's something that I'm sharing today and you're like, Trey, I don't agree or Trey, I don't really get that. Can you explain more or Trey? I think you should push more on this or Trey. But you said this. But what about this? You know, or Trey, that really hit. Can we talk more about that? You know, or, or, you know, whatever your feedback is, any questions, any comments, any concerns, uh, feel free to drop them in the comment section or reach out uh, at no wall at no walls. Now what at Gmail dot com. And we'll be sure to let's talk about it. Like, let's have a conversation about it. Um, our relationship with God is not a private relationship. It's personal. It's personal, but it's not private. Um, First John one talks about growing in fellowship. Uh, growing in our relationship with the Lord is also growing in fellowship with our brothers and sisters who are also in Christ. And so let's grow. Let's grow together, you know. And maybe you hit on something that I didn't really realize, you know. I do also want to say that uh, because we're talking about freedom, the Bible has a lot to say about freedom. Um, and so because we're talking about a theme and not a passage, we're going to look at a few different passages. Uh, we're going to look at a few different passages throughout the Bible uh, and yeah, and try to do that quickly. Um, and we're going to allow that to speak to uh, what the Bible has to say 
about freedom. So in today's message, what we're going to do is we're going to ask three questions. One, we're going to ask, how might society or culture view freedom? Second question we're going to ask is, okay, well, this is how society and culture thinks about freedom. How does the Bible view that, right? Like, how does the Bible view freedom, or how does the Bible interact with how culture sees freedom? And then after that, we're going to ask the question, so what? You know, now what? No walls, now what? Um, We're going to ask, okay, this is how society and culture thinks about freedom. This is how the Bible might think about freedom. So now what do I do? How do I live my life? What am I called to as a result? So those are three questions we're going to do. Um, That's it. And we're going to be done. Again, we're going to ask the question, how might society and culture view freedom? How might the Bible talk about freedom? If it does, and then now what? What what do I do now? How do I live now? And again, this isn't going to be comprehensive. I wish that it was. I apologize ahead of time. But if you want to hear more, let's talk about it. So first question, how might society and culture view freedom? Um, I think one way to put it is, I want to do, when we want freedom, we want to do what we want to do when we want to do it, the way we want to do it. I'll say it again, and I'll probably repeat it a few times. I think in society and culture, we view freedom as doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, the way we want to do it, or having what we want to have, when we want to have it, the way we want to have it. Again, freedom in society and culture typically, and, and maybe you, you have a different different view, and, and let's, you know, again, reach out, let's interact with that. But I think typically it comes back to freedom is doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, the way you want to do it, or having what you want to have the way that you want to have it. Uh, and so, I mean, what are some examples? I mean, think of Burger King. Burger King's slogan is have it your way. <laughs> you know, it's that simple. It's right there in our face. We want to do what we want to do the way we want to do it, when we want to do it. We want to have what we want to have, when we want to have it, the way we want to have it. We want to get what we want to get, the way we want to get it, when we want to get it. And for us, that's freedom. You know, I I know good and well. I mean, me as an example, me, I know there's high schoolers and college students, middle schoolers even, who are like, I cannot wait to get out of my parents' house. And adults, don't be saying amen, because I know you know what that feels like too. You know, you're just ready to get out of the house, and you're just like, I just want to be able to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, the way I want to do it. I want to be able to have what I want to have. When I want to have it, the way I want to have it, I just want to get what I want to get. When I want to get it, the way I want to get it, I'm just ready for that. You know, we're ready. We're ready for what we call freedom, right? We want to get what we want to get, the way we want to get it, when we want to get it. And so, yeah, I think that's a pretty universal experience when it comes, at least to the to Western society. That's how we view freedom, is doing what we want to do, when we want to do it the way that we want to do it, having what we want to have, when we want to have it, the way we want to have it, and getting what we want to get, when we want to get it, the way we want to get it. I mean, we also see this in the movie Nemo. I don't know if you've seen Nemo. Uh, It's a very complicated uh, storyline. It seems simple, but when you look at it, you see the dad, uh, the, the dad, I forget his name, I think it's Marlin or Merlin or something like that, he he's traumatized, right? He he's traumatized father, and and as a result, his trauma response is to to control his son, and it causes all these interesting family dynamics uh, and all these different problems. And there's a conflict, and there's a solution. It's a very complicated uh, thing going on here in the movie Nemo. It's a kids movie, but it's actually pretty informative when it comes to emotional intelligence. Um, and so I know I know that there's complicated things going on. But it's still true that Nemo wants to be free, right? In the movie, Nemo wants to go out and explore. He wants to go beyond the reef, I think it was called. He wants to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it the way he wants to do it. He wants to get what he wants to get when he wants to get it the way he wants to get it, right? And we see that even in the movie Nemo. So I think it's safe to say that our culture views freedom as doing what we want to do when we want to do it the way we want to do it, or having what we want to have, when we want to have it, the way we want to have it, getting what we want to get, the way we want to get it, when we want to get it. Um, and so I think that's I think that's how freedom is kind of defined and, and seen in culture. So when we ask the question, how might society, again, this is just contemplation, how might society and culture view freedom? Culture and society might view freedom as doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, the way you want to do it. I've said it about a million times now. So hopefully it's stuck in your head. <laughs> but hopefully hopefully you resonate with that, right? 
Is that true? Would you say that that's, do you agree with that? Um, I, I think that's kind of how society would view freedom. Now the question is, now that we've answered that question, the question now is, okay, now that we have an idea of how society and culture might view freedom, how does the Bible view our culture's perspective on freedom? And how does the Bible view freedom? Right? How does the Bible talk about freedom? What is the perspective that the Bible has on freedom? All right. And so what we'll do now is we'll just compare this the society's definition to maybe what the Bible has to say about freedom. Think about think about it. Uh, we see it very early in the very first pages of the Bible, right? Adam and Eve. And again, we're going to look through a bunch of passages. There is no focus verse because we're talking about a theme, and themes deserve, you know, comprehensive, uh, which means they we deserve to look at the entire scope of the Bible, Old and New Testament, and what it has to say. So we're not looking at just one passage. We're going to look at a few. So when we look at the first couple of pages in the Bible, uh, we we see. Uh, that God tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, right? Be fruitful and multiply and fill all the earth, right? And then he goes on in Genesis 2 in, a, in the second creation account, uh, the second creation narrative. Uh, God says, eat of every tree in the garden, except do not eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And I mean, there can be so many different sermons in this one, this one story, this one passage of scripture. But you know, I'm, I'm going to spare you the, the details and all of that. And so what happens? God tells them, look, I want you to prosper. Uh, maybe a better word than prosper because there's so many bad, uh, so many uh, unhelpful connotations of prosper. Maybe a better way of saying it is God wants Adam and Eve to flourish. He created them to flourish. What do we see in Genesis 1? We see God bring order to chaos. We see him bring life to something that doesn't exist, right? God's desire is to bring life. And when life is created, when life is brought, whether it's the animals or the plants, the trees, the water, or humans, he says, it is good. About humans, he says, it is very good, right? So God's desire is to bring life and, and, cause, and, and cause this world to flourish. And he wants to partner with humans to do that. He wants to partner with Adam and, Adam and Eve to make this world flourish. Right? And so that's what we see in, the first, in Genesis 1. That's what we see to begin Genesis 2. And God says, so that you can flourish, look, enjoy, right? Enjoy all of the trees in the garden except this one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat it yet. It's not time. Right? But what do Adam and Eve say? Adam look I mean Eve looks at the tree and she sees that it's it's good like it's a beautiful tree that's just the reality it's a beautiful tree and it's desirable for food that's what the bible says when god created it it says god created two trees that were both good they're beautiful and desirable for food and Eve acknowledges that she sees that beauty that god created the tree with but she lives outside of god's boundaries right Eve looks at the tree, and Adam and Eve, they, they look at the tree, and they disobey God. God had boundaries set up. His, his commands, his commandments, their are boundaries set up. Um, they're a way of life so that we can flourish, right? Which is a whole sermon in itself. But they decide to live outside of that, right? And why did they decide to live outside of that? Because they wanted to do what they wanted to do, when they wanted to do it the way they wanted to do it. They wanted to have what they wanted to have when they wanted to have it the way they wanted to have it. Adam and Eve wanted to get what they wanted to get when they wanted to get it, the way they wanted to get it. And sure enough, they did. And so we can even see how our society and culture, how that's how we see we see a reflection. We see the Bible is, is showing us uh, our own hearts, right? About our own desires, about our own actions that when we chase and look at what happens as a result adam and eve they they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they disobey god's command and what happens they experience death right and yes physical death they brought physical death and destruction into this world i mean we see that you know with uh, Ahmad Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. We see it with Israel and Palestine. We see it. I mean, we see it all over the place. We see it with COVID, right? They, as yeah, and we see it with COVID, and we see all this death and destruction. That's a result of of sin, <laughs> right? And so, 
we see that it does bring a real practical uh, death, physical death. It also created a spiritual death, right? A separation from God, right? What happens when Adam and Eve eat of the tree? What immediately happens? They recognize that they're naked and they become ashamed and they become fearful. They hide. They have shame. They have guilt and they have fear. And I know we can all resonate with those three. And whether we acknowledge it or not, we we have and sometimes still do. I mean, I know I do experience shame and, and guilt and, and fear. And that's what they experience when they do what they want to do, when they want to do it, the way that they want to do it. They live outside of God's commands for them. It causes death and destruction. And it le- that leads to shame and guilt and fear. I mean, we see it right there in the story of Genesis. Think about it like this. Here's an analogy. There's a fish. Some of you might say this is an oversimplification of an analogy, but I'll take it. Um, this analogy, there's a fish swimming in water. And, you know, the fish, he's swimming with his school of fish. And he's like, you know what? I want to be free, man. I want to be able to explore the land. I just want to go and and just explore the land and be able to go on land and water. You know, and, and I just want to be free. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I want to be able to get on the land when I want to get on the land and get in the water when I want to get in the water. I don't want to be bound by these limits, right? I don't want to be held back. I want to be able to experience my best life, right? I want to be able to get on land and water. The fish decides, okay. This is what we're going to do. He goes and he flops onto the beach. He flops on the beach and two flops later, the fish is dead. End of the story. The fish is dead. Did he experience freedom? No, he experienced death. Right? Why did he experience death? Why did the fish experience death? Because he tried to live outside of the way, the, the purpose in which he was created. He tried to live outside of the way he was created to live. The fish was created to live in water. And when that fish tries to get outside of the way it was created, it leads to death. Y'all, when we when we try to live outside the way God has created us to live, when we want to do what we want to do the way we want to do it, when we want to have what we want to have, we want to have it our way, like Burger King says, when we want to get what we want to get the way we want to get it, without any consideration of God or in disobedience to God, that leads to death and destruction. It leads to our death and destruction, right? I mean, look, the Bible says it too. Romans 6, 23, <laughs> for the wages of sin is death. I know, look, I told you, we're looking at all the whole Bible. So we go into the New Testament now. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. I know y'all know what a wage is because some of y'all are trying to get the, the, the government to pay us a higher minimum wage. You're trying to say, look, I need about 20 an hour because 725 ain't cutting it. And you're right. You should probably get paid at least 15. Minimum wage should be like 15 an hour. But anyways, we know what a wage is. A wage is a payment, right? It's what we earn. It's a result, right? So what this verse is saying is the result, the payment, what we've earned for our sin is death. What leads to, what leads to death and destruction is sin, right? That's what we see. My doctor, he, my, I went to a doctor this past week, actually, um, a couple of days ago, and uh, he's an ear doctor, and um, he, I had some problems with my, I have some problems with my ears, and he, uh, he asked me about some of my symptoms, and I just gave him one or two symptoms that I've been experiencing, and then he starts to list off all of these habits, these lifestyle habits. He starts to list them off, and I was just kind of puzzled, like, hold on, how do you know? all this about me i didn't tell you are you spying on me hold up big dog what you 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 spying on me is the, is the government selling you my information you know i was trying i was being i was getting skeptical because he was i mean and what his conclusion was is that you eat too late at night he said you eat too much too late at night and he said trey like our our bodies are i don't think he was a christian uh, but he, he was saying that, Trey, our bodies are biological entities. Every living organism is a biological entity. And as biological entities, there's ways in which we have to care for our bodies. There's ways in which we have to live because if we don't, it leads to damage. As he was inspecting my ears and my nose and my throat, he, uh, he said, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of damage here. And all of these habits happen because this damage happens because of your poor habits. 
and your poor habits are happening because of you're eating too late at night. You're eating too much too late at night. And he said, Trey, like, no, they, they, they taught you in school that breakfast should be is the most important meal of the day. And that should be your biggest meal. Lunch should be smaller and din- dinner should be your lightest meal of the day. And it should not be late at night. And he was like, because when you do that, you're damaging your body. And I was like, oh, my gosh. That is literally what the Bible teaches. When we live and yeah, so I'm, I'm having to eat earlier at night and lighter meals. What he, was, what he was saying is what the Bible teaches. What I'm, what I'm trying to illustrate here, and what, what, as we address how society thinks about freedom, what, what the, how the Bible addresses how society talks about freedom. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that when we live our life um, doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, having what we want to have, when we want to have it, the way we want to have it, getting what we want to get, when we want to get it, the way we want to get it, and disobeying or being indifferent towards God's commands, it leads to death and destruction. It doesn't lead to our flourishing. Remember, when God, in Genesis, God wants to create life. He wants to promote life. He wants us to flourish. He wants, Jesus says, a New Testament, Jesus says, I came so that you would have life and have it more abundantly, right? God's desire is for us to experience life, and that is true freedom. But, we don't do that. We do what we want to do when we want to do it, the way we want to do it, right? That's what society and culture teaches us. And some of us haven't gotten to that point yet, but we're chasing that. We're chasing the idea of being able to do what we want to do when we want to do it, the way we want to do it. So we haven't experienced that yet, but that's what we're chasing. And the Bible says, okay, but you have to realize that when you do that, you actually, whenever you do what you want to do, the way you want to do it, the way you, when you want to do it, it actually leads to destruction because the way us humans we work, we're pretty selfish people, right? We're not, we're not, we're pretty selfish people, and being selfish leads to so much death and destruction. Again, Romans six twenty three: for the wages of sin is death. Adam and Eve did what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it, the way they wanted to do it. They wanted to have the fruit of the tree of God, of knowledge of good and evil, and it lead it led to death and destruction. So I hope this makes sense. So I think the Bible would address um, our society and culture's view of uh, freedom as probably not helpful and actually leading to our death and destruction. Some of you are like, okay, Trey, but I've been living my whole life with this perspective of freedom, and I've been living this way. I've been trying to do what I want to do when I want to do it, the way I want to do it. What does God think about me? Some of us are like, Trey, I've been chasing, I haven't gotten there yet, but I've been chasing that. What does God think about me? What is, what is God's response to me? Well, that, that's a great question. It's a fair question. Because when we realize our sinful nature and our selfish nature, and we realize that we've been doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, the way we want to do it, without any care in the world of what God thinks, or we live in disobedience to God, we realize we start feeling a lot of shame. We start uncovering a lot of guilt. We start uncovering a lot of fear. But look at how God responds to Adam and Eve, right? Look at how he responds to them. Some of us would say the first way God responds is by cursing them. But it's not, right? The first way he responds is by asking them questions, right? He asks them questions. He invi- God invited them into the process of understanding their sin. God was being therapeutic. and <laughs> Some of us need therapy. And that's not a joke. That's me being serious. Uh, we need to understand our shame and guilt and our fear and how God interacts with that. God's first response was not to condemn Adam and Eve. In fact, he invited them in. And in fact, they had covered themselves, but it wasn't adequate. And so God covered them. And there's a whole sermon in this about how God shed the blood of an animal to save Adam and Eve. Just like, you know, the story of Abraham and Isaac, just like the, the, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. I mean, that's a whole sermon in itself, too about how God, his love and his grace, his mercy, and how he sought to cover Adam and Eve. God loved them. His response was to love them. Yes, he cast them out of the Garden of Eden. The reason why is because he's a holy God. And our sin, because it leads to death and destruction, it it causes separation between us and God. And so we're separated from God, right? But God's response to that separation, God's response to that death and destruction, God's response to our sin, God's response to us doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, the way we want to do it, without a care in the world as to what he thinks. His response is to love us and to change our hearts, right? 
That's what the gospel's about. I mean, going back to Romans six twenty three, for the wages of sin is death, but, but, God is offering us a gift, and that gift is life, right? and it's life forever. It's a life that starts now. What is life? What is eternal life? John seventeen three. I told you we're gonna be everywhere in the Bible. John seventeen three. Jesus says. This is eternal life, that they might know you, talking about God, they may know you, the Father, and the Son, whom you, have, that whom you have sent. What is Jesus saying there? He's communicating that eternal life is knowing God. When you know somebody, what does that mean? It means you have a relationship with them. Eternal life is having a relationship with God. What does that mean? We can experience eternal life now. And so Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is an eternal relationship with God that conquers even death, doesn't even stop it. All right. How do we receive this relationship with God? It's, it's done through what Jesus has done. It's through Jesus that we experience this relationship with God. All right. God's response to our sin, he, he did it. Right. God has spoken. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1. God has spoken. He has called us to himself. So now we know how the Bible might speak to freedom in society, how we view it. Right? We're going to kind of go through this pretty quickly. The Bible, we, we, learn, we ask the question, how might society and culture view freedom? It's doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, the way you want to do it, having what you want to have, when you want to have it, the way you want to have it, getting what you want to get, when you want to get it, the way you want to get it. I could start a rap out of this. Doing what you want to do, the way you want to do it, when you want to do it, getting what you want to get. Okay, let me stop. We talked about that, how society and culture might view freedom. And we talked about, okay, how does the Bible respond to that, right? And when we realize that the Bible doesn't hold that perspective of freedom in a high light, actually that perspective of freedom, when we live that way, leads to death and destruction. How does God respond to our lifestyle when we live that way? Well, he's done it. He's died on the cross and paid the punishment of death that we deserve. Right? He lived the perfect life so that even though we don't live the perfect life and we fall short of living the perfect life, he has lived it. And, and God has credited us with righteousness. Is that When he looks at us, he looks at us as righteous because of what Jesus has done. That means that even though we sin, uh, if you are in Christ, God still looks at you as you are righteous and holy. We're holy and we're not yet holy. We're holy and striving to be holy. We're righteous and striving to be righteous. Right. And there is no condemnation, Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ. Romans 8, 1. Right. So God's response to our sin, to us doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, the way we want to do it, his response is by li- he sent Jesus to live the perfect life, to die the death we deserve. And, and Jesus, he raised Jesus from the dead. And because Jesus is raised with the dead, those of us who were raised from the dead, those of us who are in Christ are also raised with him into a new life, into a life of flourishing. Right. So, but that still doesn't answer the question, though. How does the Bible talk about freedom? And we're just going to look at one verse here. Uh, again, there's so much, uh, but we don't have time for that. Just one verse, Exodus chapter 10, verse 3. It says, So Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? That's Moses and Aaron talking on behalf to Yahweh to Pharaoh. And what they say is, Let my people go. What does that mean? It means free my people. And what is he, what is what are the following words? It says, That they may serve me. Why what's what's freedom here how does the bible talk about freedom in this verse he says free my people let my people go so that they may worship me that they may serve me all right in this verse we find that freedom is actually living uh, in worship of yahweh freedom is living in partnership with yahweh it's living in relationship with yahweh and so when we look at this verse in Exodus chapter 10, verse 3, it says that, that uh, Yahweh is, is saying, free my people. And what freedom for my for, for freedom looks like is, is serving me, it's, it's worshiping me. And we don't have time to really get into the details of what serving me means. Um, it means living with God. Um, we don't have time to get into, into the weeds of that. Um, but we can't talk about worshiping God, right? So how does the Bible talk about freedom? It's pretty simple. The Bible talks about freedom as a life of worshiping God. It's a lifestyle, right? So 
How might society and culture view freedom? Have what I want, when I want it, the way I want it. Do what I want to do, when I want to do it, the way I want to do it. Get what I want to get, when I want to get it, the way I want to get it. How might the Bible view that perspective of freedom? The Bible doesn't say that that's actually freedom. The Bible actually says, like a fish trying to swim on dry land, that that lifestyle leads to death, right? That does not lead to freedom. It leads to death. What leads to and but even though we live that way, God still loves us. And instead, he's provided a way for us to still flourish, right, through through Jesus, Romans 6.23. And so then, okay, so that's how the Bible responds to us and to society. Well, then how does the Bible define freedom? What does freedom look like? If God really wants us to flourish and experience freedom, what does that look like? Exodus 10.3 says uh, that, that freedom is, is serving and worshiping Yahweh. So now we finish with this question and we're done. The question is, so what? Now, well, now what? Freedom, if, if we're looking for freedom, if we want to find freedom, we can only find freedom in worshiping God. And worshiping God is not singing songs. Yes, that is one way of worshiping God. Yes, we can worship God by singing songs. That is, that is a great way, actually. There's a whole book in the Bible. It's, I think, the largest book in the Bible, the Psalms, uh, filled with songs of worship to Yahweh, uh, to God, to Jesus, right? Uh, and so singing songs is, is definitely a way that the Bible encourages us to worship God, but it's not the only way. Worship actually is defined as a as a worship, I think the, the etymology, which means the history of the word, um, comes from, it, it, what it means is that it's worth something. Like, when you live a life of worship, whatever you're worshiping, you're saying, that thing is worth the way that I'm living, right? Um, and so worship is a lifestyle, right? And we worship God. It's a lifestyle of obedience to God because we're saying that God is worth it. We understand that God wants us to flourish and that we're going to be obedient to God. Yes, because we love him. Yes, because we understand that freedom, right? Uh, freedom is and flourishing is only experienced in this type of lifestyle, living in Christ, right? But then that still leaves us with a few problems, right? And this is where, you know, reach out, let's talk more in the now what section, you know, if, or if there's any other questions that you want to talk about. But the question now is, okay, but if worship is a lifestyle and it's a lifestyle of obedience to God, how can I be obedient to God? Because I struggle being obedient to God. He said not to date this girl and I date her anyway. He said not to do this and I did that. I don't even, sometimes I don't even think about what he says because I don't want to think about what he says because I don't want to be restricted because I want, I want society's definition of freedom. We obey because of his love, right? We love because he first loved us. And this goes back to even the very beginning of what I was talking about. Um, but we obey God because of his love for us. It's his love for us that deepens our desire to be obedient. Um, it's his love for us and not an understanding of, of his will that he wants us to experience true life. He doesn't want us to be like a fish on dry land. He wants us to be like a fish in water so that we could flourish. I mean, think about it. The water, the earth is 75% water. There's so much more for that fish to explore and when it comes to water than it is a land, right? God wants us to flourish. Um, and we experience that by living a life of worship. We worship God by being obedient to God. We're obedient to God because of his love for us. We live in a partnership with God, right? God, from the get-go, wanted partnership with us, right? And so that's what he's calling us to. I'm not sure if this message was clear. I'm not sure if it made much sense. <laughs> I hope that it's uh, it's turned you uh, to Yahweh and to scripture. I hope it gives you a, a deeper understanding of how the Bible talks about freedom compared to how society talks about freedom. Um, and I, yeah, I want to interact with you. If you have questions and you want to understand more deeply about what this looks like. And if you have questions about slavery, see, I mean, this is a long message as it is, and we didn't even talk about slavery. Um, if you have questions about slavery, let's talk about it. Um, slavery in the Bible. Let's let's get into it. Drop it in the comment section. Like let's let's talk. Like let's grow together in understanding God's word. Um, and I do have one final question, and that is: Have you acknowledged to God that you want to live a life of worship? 
Have you acknowledged to God that you want to live in partnership with him, that you want to live in a right relationship with him? If you have, remember what keeps you. What keeps you is not your obedience to God. That's not what keeps you saved. What keeps you saved is not how well you obey God. And I know that some of you, that might shatter a lot of your theology, but that's true. What keeps us is not our obedience to God. What keeps us is God's love and faithfulness and justice towards us, towards what he's done on the cross. If you have acknowledged to God that you want to be in partnership with him and you are walking in that partnership with God, remember what keeps you. It's not our obedience to God. It's God's love for us. It's not our love for God. It's God's love for us. If you have not acknowledged to God that you want to be in a partnership with him, if you're not walking in a partnership with God, if you're not in Christ, I encourage you to reach out to knowwallsnowwhat at gmail.com or to drop something in the comment section. Let's talk about what that looks like. Um, there's a lot, you know, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, and, and just know that uh, you can you can make that known now. You can let the Lord know now, God, I want to live the rest of my life in partnership with you. I want to trust you with my life um, and reach out and let's talk more about the gospel and, and what the Bible, the message that the Bible is trying to convey. Um, again, any questions, comments, concerns, I want to interact with you. I'm telling you, I, if you have questions, I want to talk about them. Um, this is, yeah, I mean, this is one of the reasons I live <laughs> is to talk to people about, uh, to understand really um, people's perspectives on the Bible. And I, I enjoy learning from other people. So let's talk about it. And I hope, again, that this message was, was uh, yeah, I was able to at least to some degree give you an understanding of Scripture and to turn you uh, towards God's love. Remember, society views freedom as doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, the way you want to do it. And that's how we live our life. But it leads to death and destruction. Uh, God calls us to live in true freedom, which is relationship with him. And even though we don't, God has said, I still love you, and I am pursuing you. I'm not sitting back hands off. I'm involved, and I want to be a part of this. And so thank you for listening, and I uh, hope that, yeah, I hope that this message blessed you, and see you soon.